For our final panel of the day before our closing remarks, I would like to introduce Melanie de la Cruz Fiesca of the University of California, Los Angeles to lead our conversation on wealth and retirement. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors Conference organizers for pulling together this tremendous gathering of thought leaders to discuss gender and the economy. And thanks to those of you who continue to join us for this last panel. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome three extraordinary speakers to discuss gender wealth and retirement. First, we have Ida Rademacher, who is the Vice President of the Aspen Institute at the executive, and the Executive Director of the Aspen Financial Security Program. Um, since joining the Institute in 2015, Ida has combined her expertise in economic inclusion, research, and policy with her reputation as a collaborative and creative thinker to expand FSP's efforts to bring to the national forefront a solutions-focused discussion of how America can actually improve economic growth by addressing growing levels of wealth inequality and household financial insecurity. Her efforts have resulted in the creation of several new cutting-edge initiatives including the Expanding Prosperity Impact Collaborative, EPIC, the Reconnecting Work and Wealth Initiative, and the Aspen Leadership Forum on Retirement Savings. We also have uh, Amy Matsui, Director of Income Security and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. Uh, she works on a broad range of economic issues affecting low and moderate income women and families with special emphasis on federal and state tax policy. Her work comprises policy analysis, state and federal advocacy, and public education and outreach. Prior to joining the center in 2002, Ms. Matsui was an associate at Ferella Braun and Martell LLP in San Francisco, California. She clerked for the Honorable Carolyn Dineen King, then Chief Judge of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2000. She was a graduate of UC Berkeley and Stanford Law School. And our last speaker is Sally Krawcheck, um, who will be joining us shortly uh, at 3.45 p.m. Um, she is the CEO and co-founder of Elevis, a tax-first financial company built by women for women to help her earn more money, save more money, and invest to grow her money by providing the products and coaching to do so from her first dollar through to, through to private wealth services. Um, Elevis is one of the fastest growing digital investment platforms and has been named a number 24 on CIBC's top 50 disruptor list number 14 on LinkedIn's 50 most sought after startups and one of Entrepreneur Magazine's top 100 brilliant ideas. Uh, before launching Elevis, Krawcheck built a successful career on Wall Street. She was the CEO of Merrill Lynch, Smith Barney, U.S. Trust, City Private Bank, Sanford Bernstein, and CFO for Citigroup. Uh, Krawcheck has also been called one of the top 10 up and coming entrepreneur, entrepreneurs to watch by Entrepreneur Magazine and has landed on Vanity Fair's the 2018 new established establishment list. So as you can see, we are uh, going to be joined by these amazing thought leaders. And so we're going to start off with Ida, who's going to provide an overview of the state of retirement security for women, uh, followed by Amy, who will discuss impacts they anticipate as a result of the pandemic and some policy solutions to address retirement disparities, uh, particularly faced by women of color. And then um, Sally will follow to offer thoughts on the market side and how investments are done. So Ida, I welcome you to the screen. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, and it's great to be here with, with everybody. And, and I think uh, it's gonna be a collective effort to unpack the state of retirement security for women in this country. So I'll try to kick us off, but I know that this is gonna be an iterative conversation. It's also gonna be a bit of a capstone referring back to so much that we've already heard today. And I'm just so delighted with the way that this conference has unfolded with the expertise, with the, with the just there's such an agenda here. And so congratulations to the Federal Reserve and, and I look forward to, to the next piece of the conversation. Um, when it comes to wealth and retirement, there is, I think, a, a three part statement I wanna say that I think is the, the single most important thing that needs to be said on this um, overall, the kind of C-spot run version of kind of what, what this is as a culminating measure of all of the things that we've just been talking about all day long. First, assets and wealth are in fundamental ways differ than income in terms of how they provide economic and financial well-being to a household. But the majority of ways that people can create wealth in their life come from that fact that they have investable income 
because of the ways that we had been talking about all of the ways that women experience cash flow and emergencies and dealing with everything in their life. So, so wealth is fundamentally different in terms of uh, how it functions in somebody's life. It's one of the most critical functions of wealth. We're coming out with a new paper soon that talks about all of the different functions of wealth, but certainly the one about uh, how wealth functions to give people agency and ownership and decision-making and independence, especially in retirement is critical. When it comes to retirement, this is number two, women actually need more, not less wealth. And that's not what's happening in this country either right now. And number three is that reforming the ways and really putting together a new wealth agenda in this country that includes both the retirement savings system, public and private pieces of that, and the broader benefit systems we've talked about all day today. These are the most powerful things we can do to help women build wealth and long-term financial security but it's gonna be more than just helping those women because if we do this for women, if we anchor on women and specifically on what will work for women of color, it will help our entire economy rebound sustainably, inclusively, and robustly. Um, so let me just spend a couple of minutes unpacking this and then, and then we'll get into the conversation together. So number one, this idea that wealth is critical to financial security and to retirement security, to longevity, to well-being. Uh, women's wealth in particular, matters and there's a big gender gap. Uh, and a lot of this has been alluded to already today, but just to put it all in one place, uh, today the women's wealth gap is far greater than the income gap in this country. Women earn about uh, 79 to 82 cents, depending on where your most recent survey of consumer finances data comes from. Um, they earn about 79 cents on the dollar to men, but they only own 32 cents of wealth. And that's at this aggregate level, which we all know is kind of like trying to um, write calligraphy with mittens on. So it's not really gonna help us with, with the data. Um, women of color uh, own pennies on the dollar. Uh, the median net worth uh, for African-American women, for Latina women is between 200 and $100, that's median. Uh, the majority of those households then at below median are not just at zero, they might be in net debt. And so we're, if we're talking about a conversation about wealth being one of the important pieces of financial resilience and people don't even have near the $400 that we talk about often is needed to handle the smallest of emergencies, um, we're dealing with that. And just to put that in perspective, um, when you think about women not having that much wealth, Two thirds of female headed households over the age of 64 in this country are single women. And nearly one in five families and half of black families with minor children are headed by single mothers. The gender wealth gap has enormous consequences for the economic security of children and families and future generations. Um, in addition to the gender and the racial wealth gap, millennial women have a median wealth of zero. Women ages 39 to 49, 35 to 49 have a median wealth of about $1,000. Uh, that's about 4% of the median wealth of men of the same age. Divorced women have about a fourth of the wealth of divorced men. So that's just some of the different ways to cut this. Uh, you can see the general trend. Um, let's just cut for a second to where that wealth comes from because this is where I wanna get into the retirement piece of the conversation. If you look at the balance sheet of the typical American household or the, you know, the, the, the middle class, the places where wealth we know is so important to make things sticky um, in terms of mobility and everything else, um, it really shows up in the survey of consumer finances in three places. It shows up in uh, uh, home equity. That's really over 80% of where low and moderate income households uh, have their wealth. It shows up in retirement savings. Financial assets, yes, but the majority of Americans, their gateway into financial assets is through a retirement savings, a workplace-based retirement savings system. Um, that primary residence is about 26% of the overall net of uh, a net worth. Um, then another 35% of those financial assets and a full 15% of those are in retirement savings systems. And then there's about 20% that's in business ownership as well. But most of that net worth, as we talked about earlier, and I think is showing up in those higher income households. Um, 
interesting finding in terms of well-being, in terms of wealth, is that this is an interesting study that the Capital Group just put out. In terms of um, households with the same amount of wealth, those that had more liquidity and more financial in their stack, financial wealth in their stack, had much higher degrees of retirement confidence and economic well-being. Uh, so, uh, so wealth matters overall. The composition of your wealth matters as well. Um, and then I want to also call out there that in terms of wealth, that retirement number is large, and it's especially worth noting when you consider the following. Retirement savings in this country, in the most recent um, survey of household economic decision making, 25% uh, of households report having no retirement savings. And 33% of households currently have a defined contribution access and are participating in that in their job. 55% of women um, have access overall to a 401k and over a lifetime, about a little over half of Americans have access. But in that specific moment at time, about a third of people are actually using and actively participating in a plan. So if it's already, if retirement savings is already a big piece of the wealth equation, and yet we're kind of working with one arm tied behind our back in terms of who even has access and what is the level of income they have to save, um, we could do a lot to leverage that system to achieve some more of the goals that we're talking about in this panel. Um, I just wanna share that COVID did exacerbate a lot of the trends we're seeing overall. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, had to drain emergency savings if they had them. Uh, we didn't see a lot of the emergency loans coming out of retirement funds, but of course, for many people, that wasn't really an option. There is uh, an increase, we've been calling it a bit of a debt tsunami in terms of who is taking on additional debt to cope with the end of eviction moratoriums or to deal with the loss of health care during the loss of a job and all of those things. Uh, and then for women who did have access to retirement savings over a quarter, and this is a highly different finding than men, a quarter of women reduced or stopped contributing to those employer sponsored uh, retirement accounts. Um, uh, and said that they were more likely to stop participating in their brokerage accounts uh, during COVID. If there's any silver lining there, we can get to later, and maybe this is a tee up for Sally. Women are placing more importance than ever before on savings and retirement. They're focused on it, just like we see the kind of in stark relief who didn't have um, uh, a safety net during uh, COVID. Women are also thinking much more in terms of um, longer term savings and the, and the value of this. Um, let me quickly say, number point number two, when it comes to re save, retirement savings, women need more, not less. They live longer. Their uh, longevity is more expensive because of health care. Um, and so, uh, and due to all the other things we talked about earlier, uh, less income uh, because of wage disparities, part-time work and flexible work, fewer years in the caregiving, uh, the, all the things Amy's going to talk about, because of all of that, women are far more likely to suffer from retirement insecurity. Um, uh, women over 65 are 80% more likely than men to live in poverty. Um, they're more likely to exhaust their retirement savings in, in old age. Uh, their risk of insecure retirement is even greater. And of course, it's, it, it just double clicks every single time. Women of color, uh, single women. Um, about a third of Black and Hispanic women rely exclusively on Social Security for that retirement income, and the dollars they receive are lower, again, due to less overall time in the workforce and a lifetime of lower pay. Um, uh, in, in, and I think Amy will probably get into that, but we can talk about the average wage, what that actually looks like if you rely 100% on Social Security and you're a woman in this country, it's about $16,000. It's never, it was never meant to be the full way that we support our, our parents and our mothers and, uh, and our, our neighbors. Um, it was never the way we were going to do that. I, I often say with my team that the reason we're excited about reimagining the future of wealth and a new wealth agenda is because as this country in America, uh, we really do have to get to a point where we reject the idea that the best we can do for people is help them manage scarcity. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over. I do want to think that there's, there's a lot of policy ideas. There's a lot of private sector innovation. There's a lot of ways that this conversation in particular um, can tee up some things to be hopeful about. Thank you, Ida. 
And, and thank you for making those important dis distinctions between wealth and income, and also these nuances and factors that we need to really consider when we talk about retirement security. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Amy. Thank you so much, Melanie. I'm so delighted to be part of this really important conversation, which could not be more timely. And I'm honored to be on this panel with Ida and Sally with you moderating. So just, I really wanna build on um, some of the themes that Ida raised in her remarks. And for me, kind of the topic of retirement security is really you reap what you sow. And by that, as I'll talk about a little bit more, it's the fact that women's retirement assets and income really reflect the cumulative impact of a lifetime of disparities. So many of the factors that Ida referred to um, undermine women's retirement security over time. And that's where why we see what we see in women's 401k balances at the end of their careers. So I wanna focus on a couple of particular disparities as they're experienced by women of color that bear just devastating fruit in retirement because retirement savings are so tightly in, tied to employment disparities and income disparities throughout women's lives. So first I wanna to touch on the wage gap. So, um, you know, as we mentioned, women um, typically are paid less than men. And just to think about what that means over a 40 year career. So for women overall, that can be $400,000 in lost lifetime earnings. But because the wage gap is larger for women of color, wage gaps are bigger for black women, Native American women and Latinas. Over a 40 year career, the race and gender wage gap alone can cause black women to lose nearly 1 million in lifetime earnings. And the lifetime earning loss for Latinas exceeds 1.1 million. And the size of that just boggles the mind. Even if a fraction of that amount was put aside for retirement, it could make such a tremendous difference in the experience of older black women and Latinas. Just to kind of touch on another point, I know that the opening panel this moment raised the issue of occupational segregation and how that impacts women's economic security. So women are close to two thirds of the workforce in jobs that pay the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour or just a few dollars above it. And I likewise wanna note that women of color are overrepresented among childcare workers, home care workers, and other poorly paid workers like retail, restaurant, and hospitality jobs. So these are jobs that are especially unlikely to offer pensions or 401ks that can encourage or support retirement savings. And just to kind of telescope out to think about the fact that many women in low pay jobs are struggling to make ends meet from paycheck to paycheck. So it is virtually impossible when we ask them to put savings aside, much less for saving for retirement. Just to build on that point, the same factors that make it hard for workers with low wages to save for retirement make it hard for them to accumulate wealth overall. As the brilliant Anne Price pointed out this morning, women of color experience a bevy of policies and practices that strip wealth away. These include everything from discriminatory lending policies, lack of access to credit, the lack of low cost banking options, fines and fees or student loan debt, it also could be having family members that need you to transfer wealth and financial support um, in their older years, as well as yours. When women of color have less wealth overall, it's even less likely that they will have savings that are specifically earmarked for their own retirement, taking care of themselves. And if they do, if they have low levels of wealth overall, they may need to tap into their retirement savings during financial emergencies. So all of this is just to reinforce how women and women of color especially face barriers to creating wealth throughout their lives. And this includes, but is not limited to retirement savings. And just to underscore what Ida referred to, the retirement crisis that existed before COVID-19 has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. So disruptions in employment have predictable impacts on retirement savings. During COVID, many low paid jobs in which women workers predominate, retail, hospitality, childcare, suffered extremely heavy job losses. Women of color on top of that have experienced higher rates of unemployment, including long-term unemployment than women overall throughout the pandemic. 
And in the midst of a slow and uneven recovery, women of color are still lagging behind in getting back in the workforce. And in fact, unemployment rates for Latinas and Asian women actually increased from September to October. In addition, as one of the earlier panels discussed, the impact of caregiving supports on women's ability to stay in the workforce could not have been more stark during the pandemic. So, and another thing I think which is particularly hard is that um, for women generally who leave the workforce, even voluntary with small children, those are impacts that are gonna last throughout their careers, whether it's lower wages or um, periods that are spent not earning if there's any lag in getting back in the workforce. And it continues to impact women's return to work because as many women know right now, it's impossible to go back to work if there is not childcare. And this is just one example. Overall, women have lost nearly 2.4 million net jobs since February, 2020. And over 1.7 million women have left the workforce altogether. This means that women's labor force participation rate has not been this low for a generation. This obviously harms women's financial stability overall. Women of color have been more likely to lose employment income, suffer food insecurity, and housing insecurity throughout the pandemic. We saw that stimulus checks and child tax credit payments are being used to pay for basics like food, rent, and other bills. And an NWLC analysis showed that in July, over half of Latinas and nearly half of Black non-Hispanic women mostly use their advanced child tax credit to pay down debt. According to an AARP survey this spring, one in three women said that their financial situation was worse than it was in January 2020. So as Ida referred to, the pandemic hasn't only undermined women's retirement, sorry, economic security in the short term, but will have long-term impacts on their retirement security. Their ability to save for retirement has worsened, and one in five women in the AARP study reported that they dipped into their retirement savings or stopped contributing since the pandemic began because they can't spare the, 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 the contributions. Another thing that I wanted to focus on is the fact that many workers have actually been forced to retire earlier than anticipated. And this is showing to be especially true for older black workers. One really important impact of this is not only that there will be a lower paycheck than for work, but workers who retire early will receive smaller social security benefits or smaller pension benefits for the rest of their lives. And they may need to use up any retirement savings they have to supplement and make up the difference. So for all of these reasons, there is real cause for concern that gender retirement savings and income gaps will only expand in the wake of COVID especially for women of color. To address those gaps, we first need to address very broad systemic changes to address their root causes. And here I'm again paraphrasing the wise Anne Price. Measures such as raising the minimum wage would close rent, gender and racial wealth gap, wage gaps and boost women's lifetime earnings. Investing in the care infrastructure would increase women's workforce participation and their economic security generally, but it would also specifically boost their retirement savings. A report that the National Women's Law Center and the Center on Poverty and Social Poverty at Columbia University found that universal childcare would boost women's retirement savings on average by $20,000. The benefits would be even greater for women of color. For example, Black women would experience a $24,000 boost in their retirement savings. In addition, funding income supports that help families meet basic needs throughout their lives, like refundable tax credits, nutrition assistance, and housing supports, would likewise boost economic security and make it easier to build and preserve savings over time. So just to kind of put a fine point on it, some of the investments that are being discussed in the Build Back Better framework would not would address the workforce issues that hamper women's retirement security. So the second kind of bucket of policy proposals that I would suggest are focused on helping women build wealth more generally so that they can access opportunity, weather financial emergencies, and in so many of the ways that Ida described without undermining their own future retirement. 
This could include alleviating student debt because that most burdens black women, helping renters save to buy a home because so much of the wealth for families of color is in their homes. In addition, there have been policies like baby bonds, which would make it easier to build wealth from cradle to grave. In addition, addressing disparities in credit or um, mortgage disparities, predatory lending practices could also boost women's savings and help them build wealth throughout their lives. Third, I wanted to focus on improving women's overall retirement security, and this will help retirement savings go further. Social Security offers progressive, lifelong, inflation-adjusted benefits, and those are really the foundation, but only a foundation for women's retirement security. Because of disparities experienced throughout their lives, they're especially important for women of color. Social Security could be improved by increasing benefit amounts for women, providing credit for unpaid family caregivers in the benefit formula, um, another possibility is improving the special minimum benefit, which is intended for workers who spend their careers in very low paid jobs. And fourth, we should give women more ability to save for retirement in employer sponsored re retirement savings plans. For example, lowering the hours threshold for part time workers to participate in 401k plans would allow more women workers to participate because they are more likely than men to work part time. In addition, expanding the savers credit, a currently non-refundable credit intended for low and moderate income savers would be more meaningful and impactful if it were made refundable. And if, for example, that uh, refund could be deposited back into retirement savings accounts. And finally, to the extent that women have retirement savings, and especially because those savings may be smaller than men or for white women overall, we need to make sure that they're preserved. Given the tremendous job losses that women experienced during COVID, um, clear and understandable public education materials to help workers keep track of retirement savings with former employers are incredibly important. Publicizing how um, helpful it is to roll retirement savings over into another employer-sponsored plan, if possible, would also help preserve retirement savings. And there have to be a host of ways to help encourage workers to start saving again to replenish any retirement savings they depleted during the pandemic. So in closing, I just want to say that I think it's especially appropriate for this discussion to start the policy conversation focused on broad economic policies that address overall gender disparities. Women face retirement savings and income gaps because they face economic equity inequities throughout their lives. Retirement disparities are the inevitable result of an economy that does not center women's work or support women's success. So to end retirement and lifetime disparities, we need to build a more equitable economy that works for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Amy for really providing that granular detail on what kind of policies and solutions are being discussed and how we really need to rethink. Uh, you know, the pandemic has really revealed the inequities and how we really need to rethink government policies going forward. Um, so now that we've talked about the policy side, we're gonna uh, shift over and talk about the market side. So Sally, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It is really an honor to be um, on this panel with these uh, distinguished individuals and to be part of this really important discussion. I'm going to apologize in advance because there is construction going on over to the side of me. Hopefully it, it isn't too, um, too um, notable. Um, and I also recognize that we are towards the end of the day. And so my guess is all the good stats have probably already been taken. Um, you probably already know that women were moving backwards in terms of their wealth relative to men before the pandemic, and it was worse during the pandemic with women losing jobs disproportionately, women losing out on promotions disproportionately, women just losing out disproportionately. You probably already have heard that nearly three, three fourths or 72% of women with investable assets of 100K or more say the crisis has negatively impacted their ability to retire, um, according to Nationwide Retirement Institute. And of course, that number being even more acute with women with, with less income. Um, what I can perhaps add to the conversation, 
um, is that a recent study that we have done at Elevest, the Elevest Financial Wellness Survey, um, shows us what we know, which is women's uh, money is women's number one source of stress, but also instructs us that money now today is making women sick. Uh, not sick at heart, not just sick to their stomach, but literally sick. Nearly 50% of women in the United States and 61% of millennial women say money is now making them feel emotionally or mentally ill. And 40% of women overall and 58% of millennial women are saying that their physical health has suffered as a result of concerns over money. So we have even the second and third order impact the pandemic um, where this is looks to be becoming, could be a health crisis. We talked earlier, I know, about the gender pay gap and how much it can cost women over the course of their lives, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars for women. At Elevest, we also focus very much on other wealth gaps, such as the gender investing gap, where if women invested not the same amount as men, because sadly women are not paid the same as men, but the same percent of what they have coming in of the wealth of men, the, by if they were to do that, they would have hundreds of thousands more for some women, millions of more in, in uh, money over the course of their lives. Now, I've been asked to speak about the existing industry, um, and there's no doubt that the existing industry has fallen short, not because they're evil, not because they meant to, not because, or, but because just as so many industries that claim to be gender neutral really center on men, think here medical studies, which tend to be about men, or crash dummies, which tend to be built in the shape of men. So I would argue that the financial services industry has been built by men for men. In fact, I would say the traditional financial services industry, the traditional wealth management industry, has what we would call great product market fit for men and an incredibly bad product market fit for women. What do I mean by that? Uh, back when I was running Merrill Lynch, the surveys we did said that men, um, typically white men, trusted their financial advisor more than their doctor. They very rarely closed their accounts overall and reported even after the financial crisis of 07, 08, being very happy with the services and products um, provided. Women, in contrast, leave the joint financial advisor um, in the year after their partner's death at a rate of 80 to 90 percent and have ranked the industry dead last in the industries that serve them. Now, the industry has explained this by saying, well, it's pretty clear what's going on here. Women are risk averse. We know that. Here are these capabilities and services we provide and men are taking advantage of them and women are not. Therefore, nobody would ever say it this way. It's women's fault. It must be women's fault um, overall. But Elevest was one of the first that looked at this and said, huh, maybe there's another answer for it. Maybe in an industry in which 98% of mutual fund dollars are managed by men, in which 90% plus of traders are men, in which 86% of financial advisors are men, and in which in one wealth management business um, that I'm familiar with, there are more financial advisors over the age of 80 than under the age of 30, maybe, for these women, it's not about their risk aversion. Maybe this product doesn't fit. And in fact, while women under the age of 40, only a minority of them have a financial advisor, the majority that do across the ages, something like 75% believe that he or she, but he doesn't understand her. Lest you think that the new age FinTech platforms are solving this problem, um, that is not the case. And in fact, there's research on Apple downloads that show that men tend to be eight, account for 70, 80, 82 percent of those downloads. In fact, Elevest is the only fintech app that has a majority of women who download it um, overall. In addition, um, and this was mentioned a bit before, when the industry is serving these women, they tend to, in their new age algorithms, be gender neutral. That feels right, doesn't it? Um, except the problem is that if you're putting in the information and it thinks you're gender neutral, then for women, it doesn't take into account that women earn less. It doesn't take into account that our salaries peak sooner. 
It doesn't take into account that we take more career breaks and it may not take into account that we live longer. All of which, if, if it's wrong for a man, he dies with too much money. If it's wrong for a woman, she dies with too little, which can be a disaster. Now, are there any bright spots? Well, of course there are. And what we know, of course, is that when retirement savings are offered in the workplace, women may invest smaller dollar amounts, but they tend to invest a higher percent. So this is not some you know, big barrier to her. I also hope that Elevest is one of the bright spots as well, um, being the, the, um, one of the only investing firms and now broader financial services firms that was built by women for women. We today have 76% of our um, employee base women, um, just under 50% people of color as well. And so we really work at Elevest to overrepresent underrepresented groups such that we are building a product and capabilities for them. I think the second ray of hope um, is that the CEOs of the investing firms, the Wall Street firms, the financial firms, do tend to get it. They do tend to understand the power of diversity. They do tend to understand the size of this market. I think the challenge is um, as they continue to run meritocracies um, where managers are allowed to manage, you know, you can promote who you want to promote, you can hire who you want to hire and we'll judge you later. Uh, middle management continues to be the place where diversity goes to die. And so without having individuals represented in the senior leadership, um, that it's very difficult for these companies to build products and services that are really much beyond marketing initiatives that really understand you know, the needs and the challenges that these, uh, these groups face. The other um, positive that I think we're seeing is that we're seeing really an explosion in impact investing, ESG investing. And what we see is that women really, really are intrigued by this, are interested by it, and really find it as a motivator to invest. Whereas when we were doing the, what now was years of research, engaging with thousands of women on the topic of investing, I can tell you that out of all of those, we only heard one woman say, my goal in investing is to outperform. We only heard a few women say, my goal in investing is to have more money. We heard a lot of women talk about their goal in investing to achieve particular goals, such as retirement, such as buying a home. But what really often caused their eyes to light up was the opportunity to have both a financial return and a societal return as well. And in fact, something like 75% plus of women have said they are at least interested in learning about impact and ESG investing. And so as that expands, it becomes a point of interest for women. And the final, another bright spot that I will mention, which I never would have thought I would have thought was a bright spot, is as the Securities and Exchange Commission looks at loosening up regulations around testimonials. Um, and, you know, fully understanding the reasons they were there, have been there, why they make sense. My experience won't be the same as your experience with a wealth management firm and your experience might not be. We got different types, came in different times, different investors, et cetera. But if as a woman, you have had a lifetime of receiving messages from our society that you're not good with money, 90% of women's articles about money directed to women are about are negative and about saving and about coupon clipping and about scrimping so they're very much scarcity by the way 72 percent of those written to men are positive growing and investing so you have a lifetime of messages that you're not good with this that money isn't for you you're not hearing about investing you've been socialized not to talk about money so you don't even know which of your friends are investing and what they're doing or where they're getting their raise and so as a result of it, it feels very unapproachable and unattainable to you. And then you have testimonies about everything else and you're not hearing anything about people who had a good experience investing and who were able to achieve their goals. And so it feels further and further away. And so to the extent that we can always um, watch and be careful about um, over promising anything to individuals, um, you know, saying that you know, being continuing to be very clear that investing, all investing does involve risk, but the ability for it to become more part of her conversation and for her to see more people who are doing it, I think is important. Now, the other thing that I hope will become good news 
is that, you know, I think we should all recognize that it's very, very difficult to change existing cultures. And it's even more difficult to change existing successful cultures. And so, you know, for those investing firms that are doing very well as things are today, maybe not doing the ESG investing, you know, having clients who look so much like their employee base, those are tough cultures to change. So a hope here is that there will be more startups. Today, let's be clear, women CEOs, and it, you know, it probably takes a woman to understand those needs of women, maybe to be passionate enough about them to start, uh, to be authentic enough to start a company serving women. Um, but over the past 10 years, women CEOs have raised just 1% of fintech venture dollars. And there's research that venture capitalists are more likely to fund women in traditionally female roles, such as clothing, such as makeup, such as hair care, et cetera, rather than what are viewed as more male roles. In addition to that, um, women um, have received over the past year, while they're getting more and more of the seed and the Series A dollars, women CEOs are receiving just 1% of Series B dollars. And so once it comes time to scale, the intersection of the Series B and the FinTech, things get pretty, pretty slim. And so, you know, for us trying to think about ways that we can encourage uh, innovation in this, in this industry, um, where the venture capital industry is not particularly supporting it right now is, is another opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, uh, for really highlighting how the investment industry has fallen short, how we need to change the investing cultures to be more inclusive and uh, providing innovative strategies for investing. Um, you know, I wanna uh, invite you all to enter your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we received a few questions so far and so I wanna to go to one of the questions um, that was asking about, uh, you know, there have been a lot of great policy, big policy ideas proposed, but some have suggested that these ideas are not concrete enough. Um, so what are some of the manageable steps that can be taken now to strengthen women's retirement security? And, and maybe actually, um, let's start actually, Amy, um, we had that one uh, question about you know, when we when someone leaves and we enter the workplace, how does that impact their long term retirement planning and what policies or practices can be instit instituted to help ease these gaps. So uh, if you could start us off. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so I think one of the things which is really hard when someone leaves a job and they even if they have the, their retirement savings. Sometimes they are, if, especially if they're leaving, you know, under, you know, less than ideal circumstances, I'm just kind of thinking about the pandemic in particular, there are a lot of things that they're trying to keep track of and their retirement savings account information may not be the top of their list. So I think, you know, as, you know, people change jobs, it's important to remember, you know, I got to track where this money is, I need to know where it is. Um, and for, for, um, for savings above a certain amount, it will get automatically rolled over into an IRA if another place isn't designated. And that's in part to kind of preserve those retirement savings and keep them kind of um, not being spent. You know, when people are fa facing a, a financial crisis or a financial emergency, it can be very difficult to resist the temptation that you have this amount of money that's accessible and available to you. Um, if people are thinking about changing careers, they might want to invest it in their own small business. But one of the things that I think helps when people are transitioning between jobs is to track those retirement savings as much as possible, just keep them as retirement savings if possible, whether that is, you know, putting it in an IRA or rolling it over into another employer's plan where they might get more, you know, favorable protections and, um, and benefits and, and even rates of return. So, you know, some of those are inevitable, right? The kind of the, just having in your mind that when you have a sum of retirement savings, keep it protected as much as possible. You know, in a world where we're relying on people to a large extent to self-insure, right? For against their, against um, retirement insecurity, that they're kind of the stewards of their savings that they have. 
obviously, you know, everything from, you know, having more income to be able to put the money aside, having more participation and more people, you know, be able to participate and fully participate and get employer matches. All of those are things that kind of build up the savings so that it is a meaningful enough amount of money that you're, you're not tempted to cash it out unless you're, you know, in a, in a very dire financial situation. But those are some concrete steps where if people are informed, know how to actually make sure that they're preserving those retirement savings between jobs, they can make sure that they're keeping those kind of earmarked for retirement. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think related to that question, um, Ida, you know, what are you seeing in terms of policy and market innovations in the U.S. and other countries that could help close the retirement savings gap? Yeah, I, I a lot. So I'll say that, and um, uh, it's. I think that it's it's meaningful that we have this conversation at the end of the day, and that Amy puts such a helpful frame on the cumulative effects of like how how we fix this gap. You know, so I would say that there's there's lots of policy reasons to be hopeful. Uh, one, I think, overall, both in terms of uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, like Sally and uh, and, and certainly a lot of the research we've done, people have one financial life. You know, they don't live in the labor market over here and think about the policies that affect their job and live in the financial markets over here and think about uh, how they're going to save or manage that. They live one crazy financial life, usually at a kitchen table, late at night without a lot of the right resources in play. Folks are attuned to that right now. So a couple of things are happening. In terms of broad connectivity, there is a real ability to start looking at data, and this is a great research opportunity too, to understand the relationships between housing and retirement security, student loan debt and retirement security, your overall income, all the things we've been talking about all day, you know, the, the occupational segregation, all of these things. But, you know, so the idea that you have to be able to have your financial products walk and chew gum for you <laughs> is something that we should expect at this point. Um, uh, with the evolution of technology, you can be able, and they're piloting this. Um, they're piloting this in the UK, and there's certainly even a lot of talk about it here. You should be able to have an ability to build emergency savings automatically at a workplace, simultaneously to building retirement savings. Part of the reason those leakages, those those stripping happen, is because people don't have the other money. Um, I would say, I mean, back up a minute and I'd say for us, and this is, again, this is a little preview of a, a paper we'll be coming out with soon on kind of what does it take for low and moderate income households, the majority of which are women headed households, um, to, uh, to build wealth. They need the precondition of financial stability. All of the conversations we talked about earlier, boosting income, making life affordable, all of those things go into that uh, precondition of financial stability. They need investable money. So not just stability, but uh, enough there, which means that you're both boosting income and you're managing that debt. Um, they need affordable assets to purchase, consumer-friendly financing, information and confidence, all the things that Sally was talking about to navigate uh, wealth building decisions. And they need protection because they're already managing so much of the risk of this economy and a very unstable unit of, of household decision-making. So we should be able to um, pool and manage risk uh, better for those households. I would say though, so, so there's lots of legislation happening and, and thinking about pairing, you know, uh, the IRS is now giving permission to big companies. Um, and we just focused about this in um, the book we just published with the St. Louis Federal Reserve on the future of building wealth. But understanding that a lot of people coming in have a lot of student loan debt. The preponderance of student loan debt is women and women of color, right? That's the, where it's the most harmful right now. There's a chance for um, that individual to be able to pay on their student loan debt and the employer has the opportunity to still match what they would be putting toward their retirement, even though they're paying off their debt into the retirement account. That starts to help somebody amass savings and that is a doable policy innovation um, and, and, and market innovation that's happening right now. Um, at the state level, uh, the things that, that Amy talked about are refundable savers credit so that you can actually accumulate meaningful amounts. It would be great if that passed at the federal level. 
it would be great if a lot of the things that just that didn't get into the uh, 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 budget that we're talking about now, but around um, uh, automatic enrollment um, would be something that is a national issue. But I just also want to share really quickly that uh, states aren't waiting. Uh, the preponderance of the burden uh, that's going to happen because of so many financially insecure households are going to hit those state economies. They're going to hit state care infrastructure. And the leaders at the state level are taking action because of that. So to date, since 2012, um, 46 states have uh, implemented studies. Um, 12 of them have actually enacted policy to do employer-based um, uh, retirement savings, secure choice plans, work and save plans. Um, and uh, that just means that all employers, and most of those are down to you know, five employers, uh, five employees or 10 employees, they have to offer a retirement plan and uh, individuals can opt out. Most don't opt out, but they can. So uh, we are looking at the day when um, even California alone, that's gonna be 7 million new savers. And most of those are going to be uh, black and Latina headed households, they're going to be women and they're going to have a meaningful new floor around their retirement savings because of state innovation. A lot of that is coming back through to the federal level as well as an opportunity. So both in terms of pension design and in terms of policy design, there's a lot more to do here. And um, sorry, that was a little more rambling than I thought. Amy, Amy, pick me up there. No, I think those are all really great points and policies to flag. Um, and again, just to kind of underscore the way that some of the broader economic policies that we're talking about affect women's retirement security. So just kind of as another example, if you make it easier for, you know, if you have a comprehensive paid family and medical leave, it could be the case that when, you know, someone is in her 50s, which is the point where you're really supposed to be boosting those retirement savings, you're, you know, hopefully at the top of your income level but you have to cut back your hours or leave the workforce to care for an ailing family member or a spouse and you have expenses for that, that directly undermines your own retirement security. So there really is such a tight interplay between policy and retirement savings, both on the kinds of vehicles that we use to save and those you know, supports and impacts that help people be able to both care for themselves and their family members and work in the paid workforce at the same time. Can I ask, well, actually, go ahead, Melanie. I just... No, no, I, mean, I, I was gonna, just going to say, you know, going back to Secure Choice, I think it's really an important program for immigrant women, especially Latinx and, you know, Black uh, women. And so I think, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, going back to this, this conversation on, on programs that really help to provide secure finance, financial futures, you know, adding who's missing from the conversation today. So, but I didn't want to interrupt your thought process there. So, no, well, I just, I, I think especially for this population, you know, it's interesting when you talk about retirement policy, it's not ever really in, at the federal policy level, it usually gets connected to either a tax reform conversation um, or an entitlement reform, a social security conversation, but we never actually just say, this is the retirement policy as its own kind of separate area to think holistically about what households really need doesn't really happen when it comes into how it plays out um, in terms of a policy conversation. I think, Amy, the especially the innovations we just talked about were some of the private sector and reforms to the defined contribution plan. But I do think that the social security side of where there could be innovation and uh, you know also needs to be there because certainly all the time out of a labor force or how many people don't qualify um, or don't pay into the system is part of what makes that such um, a, a, an underperforming um, you know, um, pool for individuals. And, and we're, we're just now, we heard earlier today about basic income becoming an issue. People are kind of having the light bulb moment. People need cash, give them cash respect them to make decisions about their financial lives. We have that uh, ability in, 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 in shell form in social security, but it needs to be modernized too, I think, in terms of the, the, the issues of the day. So I think, you know, so we're, as we think about, uh, you know, these bigger policy issues, how do we start to deepen the message of economic security for women? And so how can we better communicate 
uh, with women about retirement through various stages of their financial lives. Do you have, all have any thoughts on how to, we can accomplish this? Do you want to go? Do you want me to go first? Which, what's your preference? It, any one of you. <laughs> I think Sally uh, jumped off for a bit. She'll hopefully join us later. So, um, so maybe Amy, since Ida just offered some remarks. Sure, I, this is not helpful, but I wanted to kind of circle back around to one of the things that Ida mentioned earlier, which is that if you don't have kind of basic financial security in your house, it's really, it's impossible to think about putting money aside that you don't have to save. So I really do think that um, it's it is incredibly important to remind people that they will need, they are gonna be the only ones who can take care of themselves at the end of their lives, their present self can save their future self by saving whenever that's possible. But I also, I really wanna push back against the idea that, um, you know, we have this ideal of, you know, you, you work for a living, you build up your career, your, your income increases, you progress in the workforce, and you have this trajectory where you're supposed to be able to save more and more over time. And instead, for a lot of people, they have a work trajectory where if you're getting paid the federal minimum wage, you haven't gotten a raise for 20 years. It's been flat. So I, I hate to, I mean, I think it's really important to remind people that where they can, where there are opportunities, they need to be saving if they can, because that will help their future selves. But we've set up systems where people can't make that equation work and we make them feel bad for it because they haven't kind of had the work ethic or the savings ethic or whatever. So I do think that we really need to have the overarching structures and systems in place that make this feasible for our lowest income workers. And then we can't turn around and blame them for not succeeding when we haven't set them up to succeed. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think I, for me, one of the biggest milestones of progress is going to be that the first question we ask isn't about how we equip people with more information to manage their complex, overwhelming lives, but how, you know, I, how to say it. For many people in this country, they, they have to per behave for systems, right? <laughs> you know, I have, to behave, I have to behave for the system. Uh, for people uh, in the jobs that offer benefits and for people that, most of the people that we talk to every day in the policy world in DC, systems behave for them. And um, we owe it to uh, the, econ the economy we want, to the families we want, to the communities we want, um, to uh, our kids and our, all of it, to make systems behave well for everyone. It, it, it doesn't have to be as fraught and moral as we've made it in this country to be poor or to be struggling. We can fix these issues. These are solvable problems. They've done it in many other countries. And we talked a little bit earlier to the political will necessary. I'd like to say this isn't even a partisan issue. Uh, when you actually meet in places like I am in rural Virginia, everybody wants the same things for their households. Everybody uh, gets the same levels of overwhelm. We have ways to make this uh, through private market innovation and public policy innovation solvable problems in our lifetimes. So we've really talked a lot about the policy innovations and the market innovations, but uh, when we start to think about like what's happening on the ground, so like the, the financial counselors, uh, the coaches that are working with low to moderate income women, um, are there resources out there that you all uh, know of or recommend, would highly recommend, you know, that could help women, um, you know, think about the retirement through, through various stages of life. So one of the questions in the chat was, you know, um, how are the resources that show how much I, I should be saving each year? Um, what income should I expect from social security when I retire? Like some kind of like measures to make sure that you're, you're on a secure path. So I'm going to put a plug in for um, the, the amazing folks over at Women's, for, Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement at Wiser. They have tons of extremely like accessible, easy to understand, super straightforward 
financial and retirement planning resources. So I would really recommend that folks visit um, Wiser and the resources that they have available there, but they're one organization that I know of and their whole mission is to make sure that women are as best equipped as possible to pursue their own financial security. So that's that's my plug. And I think there's um there's a there, there's a movement around what I want to call like financial advice for the rest of us, which is again to this idea that people's, you know, when we look at where there is subsidy for financial advice in policy, um, you can write off your tax advisor if you deduct your tax, if you, if you have enough income and the, uh, that you're actually itemizing your tax deduction. So let's just say that there is a, there's a way that um, individuals, uh, again, find ways to, to get help and the government supports that. Uh, when you're lower income, usually that kind of help comes only when there's crisis, right? There's mortgage foreclosure support or there's credit, you know, when you're already in trouble, there's, you know, kind of like a credit crisis piece. I think that there's um, a growing set of financial coaches, um, uh, neighborhood trust, financial empowerment centers, uh, the financial clinic, a lot of places that are helping people with, you know, what often I think about is A, B, A, B C, D, E, F, G. I think it's like, it's assets, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the building of, um, it's, it's their debt, it's their education, all of the different things that come into it um, so that you don't have to wait till there's crisis. Um, I also, uh, in that regard though, think that if, if Sally were still here, she would talk about how there could be more than there is uh, market opportunity and real leadership to think about taking the friction out of um, how we are designing and delivering financial information. Uh, and even this is another research place, looking at what channels people take their information. There's, there's racial differences and gender differences between where you go for your information. Mm -hmm. So part of that is let's look at the data, let's figure that out, and then let's build for a better future. So I do think that giving people that confidence is going to be very important. Giving them a kind of a no wrong door way to get the right information is going to be important. Um, but we're going to have to simultaneously think about um, what are the protections needed? What are the ways to make it easier for me to make the right decisions? Because the structures are making some of those decisions. Um, and I'll just jump in with one more thought. And because Ida mentioned taxes. So for folks who are, you know, low and moderate income earning under about $70,000, they're able to access volunteer income tax preparation services through kind of local tax community tax preparation. And so depending on your community, a lot of those, you know, um, coalitions and networks have looked at the opportunity that tax refunds provide to build financial stability, to offer access to financial literacy or asset building or um, bank accounts. And so that it, it can also be a place where um, those resources are available right at the place where people are thinking about their finances and, you know, at the kind of on the cusp of one of the, the major financial transactions that they'll have throughout the year, which is, which is their tax filing. So that's another place where sometimes those resources can be available through the VITA program. So there's another question, another question in the chat uh, that the tune seems to be changing on debt. Um, is there such a thing anymore as good debt? And if not, how do we begin to communicate this message differently? Uh, are there other narratives that the time has come to retire? So we, um, one of the programs that I started at Aspen when I came here was something called EPIC, the Expanding Prosperity Impact Collaborative. And we, we do two year deep dives on particular financial challenges facing you know, millions and millions of households. We did two years on income volatility. We're now doing two years on housing affordability and stability, but we did two years on consumer debt. Um, uh, so it, there is high, high correlation between certain kinds of debt, which is really leverage, <laughs> most households that have means use, right? A mortgage uh, that leads to an appreciating asset. Obviously, different asset appreciation opportunities by race. We know that right now. Um, we know that for sure. But there's certainly good kinds of debt. But the overall amount of debt and what is in your debt stack matters. And that looks different for women than for men. 
Um, there's also a really alarming, I mean, but here's a, I mean, a couple of just pieces of this. Most of the new net debt that people are taking on is not to um, actually help with mobility and a the, the lot of the, it is, it is just to manage this fact that Amy talked about income stagnation and rising income volatility. So debt has been the self-prescribed way to continue to make ends meet. That is not productive, helpful debt. And to the degree that a lot of the debt that we see these days in growth is non-loan debt, this is um, medical debt. It is debt from fines and fees. It is debt that people never even had credit before they started amassing debt. That is the most um, damaging, insidious issue. And even at the macro level, when that kind of debt grows, we know that that becomes a drag on the overall economy and the productive ability of households. So I, I think that there's a, it's a complex thing, um, but the kind of debt that this particular um, uh, recession and pandemic has brought on for most households and for women is debt that is not contributing to long-term mobility for them. Amy, did you have anything to add on the good debt narrative? I just would, I think the only thing I would add to Ida's extremely comprehensive um, description there is just around student loan debt. So I think, you know, we definitely have seen as part of the student debt crisis that the difference between, you know, classes that you're enrolled in or for-profit universities and, you know, programs that do increase people's earning potential when they get out Again, this is these are things that we're asking people to bear when the market won't support them on the other side. So I do think like the idea of just there's a there it's it is you know a an issue that I think people are examining very closely about student loan debt. But I mention it in part because that does also um, impact people's retirement security. So one of the things that you know, if people are signing up for student loan debt or it persists into retirement or parents are signing up for it, again, these are all things that can be a drag on retirement. Yeah, I love the, the um, phrase that someone used in an earlier panel that the classes that you take determines what you make you know, later down the road. Um, so we, we do have a couple more questions that are popping in here. Uh, there is a question about uh, for a woman without for a woman without her own business, is it possible for her to build wealth while she's paying market rate for rent without home ownership in the US? Let's see. I, th I think they meant like um, paying market rate for how does that work with the Is it possible for her to build wealth while she's paying market rate for rent um, without home ownership in the US? I guess home equity and, and business. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know we're running out of time, so I won't be like super comprehensive on all of these, but uh, I, look, housing, housing affordability uh, is at, a, at an, an historic level of, of crisis in, in many geographies, way beyond the ones that we've always associated with high rent. Um, and uh, when you couple that with people paying off for their student loan debt and other kinds of debt, um, there's going to be certainly the pieces there, but to the degree that they have access to a retirement savings plan at work, to the degree that they are um, in a gig economy um, and making sure that they're paying their quarterly taxes so that they're paying that payroll, <laughs> so they're contributing to their social security, uh, there are ways that, you know, that you don't want to put off uh, investing in your future self. And, and I channel that like our Sally, you know, who's, who's not here right now. <laughs> Certainly the earlier you start, the less you have to, you know, like the, the, the difference because of compounding interest, restarting your savings in a retirement savings account when you're 25, even if it's a struggle, even a little bit to get that match, if you have that versus starting if you're 35 or 40 is tremendous. Um, and so if there is any way to do a little, that's important. But I certainly, again, this, this is where I do think it comes into people know the best in their own lives. Are they have access to good information and good resources? Yes. 
Do they know if there's some sacrifice going on um, uh, that isn't worth the trade-off? You know, we have to honor and respect some of that too, but we should make it easier for them to do uh, the best by their future selves. I guess, uh, you know, related to that, and maybe Amy could pick up on this, uh, how do we get millennials and Gen Z who likely haven't thought much about retirement to think about retirement security? I mean, I think that, um, I think that there are, for millennials and for younger savers, as Ida said, the, the power of the time value of money and just the idea that if you can put small amounts aside, that those are going to grow over time to learn about investing, to learn about you know good places to put your money where they're earning interest rather than sitting in a savings account. So that's kind of a basic um, you know financial education, financial literacy. And again, to kind of push back on the um, you know the the myths, the idea that people are spending you know disposable income, the the trope of the avocado toast. I just don't think that most people are doing that. Most people are, you know, struggling really hard to pay rent. They're struggling really hard to, um, you know, pay off and manage their student debt. So I think just an acknowledgement that this is hard, that, you know, part of what you're doing is really um, making difficult choices about your future financial security. It may not at the very beginning be retirement savings, or it could be, it could be, you know, just kind of having emergency savings. So you don't have to go to a credit card if you end up having an unexpected expense. But I think just kind of acknowledging that, especially for people at the beginning of their careers, they, you know, maybe having to, um, to buy their time to even get a paying job, if they can afford to do that, they're putting a lot of, you know, the things on hold for their future, and they're not, you know, making the highest amount of pay that they're going to hopefully in their career. So just an acknowledgement that it's hard, people are making hard choices and to respect that people are doing that. And as Ida said, they are the, they are the experts on their lives and they know where they can cut back and where they can't. So not to put unrealistic expectations on them. And I know, I, I think Amy, that's exactly right. I, I also, you know, the changing nature of work mm -hmm. experienced differently from millennials and Gen Zs, there, there's less access to the kinds of uh, employer-based savings program until you actually create a systemic solution. You know, in the UK, it's been a decade now that they've had automatic enrollment for every single worker. Um, Opt-out rates still happen. That's where the choice comes in. Amy, you know, they might know that they shouldn't do it, but opt-out rates change the game, right? Very small percentages. And we've seen this in California and Oregon and Illinois and all of the places where they've enacted these state level automatic enrollment retirement savings plans. Um, uh, I don't think it's a, I, I, we certainly can equip people with more decision-making, but we need to structure systems where the likelihood of them having access to an account and saving into that account is real. And then when everybody has that around them, they see the dollars accumulating, they start to anchor in on bigger goals, on longer term thinking, on things that they actually don't have the luxury of time to do in other ways. So I do think that the first best answer is to get systems going that help everyone. And if people opt out of those systems, uh, certainly there's um, you know ways, and then you can do that every year, right? Automatic enrollment means you know every year you have to opt out, just like instead of every year you have to opt in. Uh, that's going to go a lot further in terms of the scale of savings that people have and the kind of head headway that we make on retirement gaps in particular. Um, to only working with these tools about how do we equip people with information, we need both. Just just to piggyback on that, Ida. So. Another question was, you know, um, can you share other examples from countries that have helped solve these uh, these problems around security uh, gaps besides the automatic enrollment program? Yeah, um, so defined contribution plans are the, the norm, you know, overall kind of fixed defined benefit pensions are going away, but certainly some of the leaders, Australia, Australia has been a, a real leader in, in this work, uh, uh, the UK, Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, you know, there's, there's, at least in terms of the retirement system, we've often talked about 
these kind of like pillar one, which is the government provided pension, ours is social security, right? And then the second would be what's the employer provided, the workplace retirement savings. And then third would be individual effort. Um, we've kind of conflated in a defined contribution system, employer savings and individual kind of come together. Mm -hmm. um, look, I was, um, uh, and, and all of them, I would say, the ones that have gone to universal automatic enrollment for every worker, no matter where they work and how they get paid, including gig workers, including part-time workers, including you know, mom and pop shops with one employee, um, it's a game changer in terms of the um, overall assets accumulating uh, for, uh, for their retirement security. Um, none of the programs in other countries were all grappling with the decumulation stage. We're all grappling with how do you take an amassed lump of money and make it last for longer and longer and more and more expensive lives um, for, for, um, for some. And then the equity piece comes in that pillar one system because, uh, because of all of the occupational segregation, because of the reasons that many people can't work uh, longer because they drop out for care or health reasons. Uh, we need to make sure that that pillar one is strong enough that people can still have dignity and agency in their lives with that work. But uh, certainly I would say um, the UK uh, is, we have a partnership with one of them with the government defaulted um, program, which is NEST. Um, and they have a NEST Insight Center, which has been doing a lot of research on kind of what is going on with low income savers, a lot of gender, they just did partner with Van Vanguard on how the UK saves with a specific gendered lens. And interestingly, once you have an automatic national savings plan, uh, there was there, nothing else, there was no difference in terms of gender, in terms of savings rates and amount being saved. Um, what was different was that for most of the people that were underneath the threshold where you still had to opt in, that's where you saw the disparities. But as soon as you had an automatic enrollment system in place, uh, that took care of most of it, which makes me say, let's make sure we manage our expectations that we're going to fix more with education than we could with structure and design. Great, right, thank you. Um, one last question here. Uh, what advice would you give to women who haven't started saving for retirement, um, but are later in their career? So, hey, Amy? So I would just say this is a great conversation to to have with your employer and if there's an employer match. So, you know, employers can offer um, a match up generally up to a certain amount for contributions that you make and that's free money that's on the table. So I think, um, you know, making as many contributions, the highest amount of contributions that you can, again, understanding kind of what your entire financial situation is and you are being the expert on what you can and cannot save but also taking advantages of the supports that are there, whether that is um, the employer match or any other supports. The one other thing that I will mention is that a lot of people don't focus on retirement savings when they're, if they're getting divorced. And so that is, I just wanna flag that that's kind of another place where there can be a disruption in your retirement savings and your savings overall. It may be a very stressful time. People may be more focused on assets like the house, but the retirement savings accounts can sometimes be the largest asset other than a house in a marriage. And so it's really important to be mindful of that as well. Do you have anything to add, Ida? Okay. Um, well, we are, are closing, getting close to the end of our hour or time together. Um, I guess I wanted to just ask both of you to offer any final thoughts, I guess, um, what are some major, uh, I guess, speaking from the advocacy point of view, um, what are some, um, I guess, major strategies or approaches we need to be taking in the next, in the short term and the long term to really address the security gap, the retirement security gap? So Ida, should, let's start with you. Oh, you're on mute. I just muted myself instead of unmuting. I would just say, as I'm thinking about the day of conversation today, the rich day of conversation, um, retirement security is a subset of overall financial security. Um, 
we're going to get further faster by not isolating it, by thinking hard about the ways that we solve for uh, people's stability needs, their resilience needs, and their long-term security needs alongside each other, paying particular attention to the societal burdens that women still bear a disproportionate role in servicing for their families and for their communities. And um, so I just think that the one, I would encourage more people to become retirement geeks. It is a fascinating and important set of work. Um, it's a really important area of policy innovation. There's real opportunity for progress in this space, um, but it's one of those things that has continued to feel like it's chronic and not crisis. But at the end of the day, I think we judge society on the, our ability to take care of our children and our elders. And in this society, we have a long way to go on both of those. And we have a moment right now where really good ideas that have stood the test of time are on the table and it's a time for leadership. Thank you. Amy, you got the last word. Oh, it's really hard to top that. <laughs> I really just kind of want to plus one everything that Ida said, but I think, um, you know, I think about retirement security as being the expression of all of the different policies and disparities and inequities that um, show up in women's lives. So I think in the very big picture, you know, as Ida was saying, we really are in a moment where we can rethink ways to make the economy work for everybody. And that will automatically improve people's retirement security because all of the different aspects of income, wealth, the ability to make basic needs and support families and invest in the future, those are all tied together, as Ida said so eloquently earlier in people's lives. They're not kind of in little slices or buckets or pamphlets. And I also um, want to kind of endorse the idea that she mentioned earlier about how this is also an opportunity to think about how we, you know, have an interface between people and policy. How can we make this as easy as possible for people to have the best possible lives? And I think, you know, retirement security, again, is an opportunity to make that as easy and feel as positive as possible when people are taking care of their future selves. So um, this is, I think that's where, that's a great note to end the, my comments on, but it's been really great to have this conversation today. Well, thank you both and to Sally for your tremendous wisdom and your insights. Um, and all of today's speakers, uh, we hope that the session was, was informative and that it gives you some ideas and inspiration uh, to guide us through these challenging times. So uh, with that, we're gonna close this session and we're gonna take a short five minute break before we convene back. Thank you. Thank you.